this has to be the most requested topic out of all the questions I have gotten. I don't have one person who commented. I have at least six, seven, eight, nine people who comment on this. And at a certain point, I just stopped grabbing comments. Oh, the birds know. I'm going there. We're talking about wildlife pests and what do you do about it in the garden? We are continuing our Vlogmas journey and oh my gosh, I can't believe we're already halfway over. This has been amazing. And what we're doing is I am answering comments via video instead of through the comment section. So if you have questions, make sure you put them down below because we are doing five videos a week until we get to Christmas. And today comes the most requested topic. I have so many different comments asking in so many different ways, what do we do about wildlife? So let's start with the basic question that kind of is going to underpin all of this. And then I'm going to hit some of these other people's questions too, which is Zella V said, how do you deal with pests or you just let them do their thing? I'm container gardening in Seminole. Hi neighbor. And I've dealt with mealybugs, my sworn enemy. Me too. Spider mites and aphids just in my tiny space. And in addition to all of these questions, we also have in Amber's world, what pest critters do you deal with most here in zone 10 B as well? And the iguanas get through and literally decimate my 300 square foot garden in an hour. It's getting so discouraging. SB asked me, do I have raccoons? Someone else asked me, do I have rice and rice, mice and rats? Do I have I don't, mosquitoes? Do I have, I don't know. There were so many different questions about what I have. So let's start with that part. What, what do I get in my garden? <laughs> so SB asked, do you have raccoons? Yes, I have raccoons. We have raccoons, we have possums, we have armadillos. They come through our yard, they dig holes. I don't get moles. I know some people have tried to give me tips because they think some of the holes are being dug by moles. Um, we don't get moles in the city I live in. Now, a little bit further, like probably about an hour north of here, when I've been on my way up to Homosassa, like I totally see the mole action happening in the northern, north central Florida area. But in my area, no moles is not a problem. Go for, go for tortoises, but not in my neighborhood. No go for tortoises in my neighborhood. Um, I do have snakes who dig holes. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. But yes, and if you're thinking like, well, she probably doesn't get that many raccoons. I do. Um, actually, when my second child was born, one dug a hole into our attic in the middle of the night, scared me almost to death because I saw someone was breaking her house. And no, there wasn't a hole there before they started digging. She was just committed. She was ready to have a baby. And she was like, hey, you just have one. We could be pals. I will go in your attic. Not fun. We had that happen for sure. K kiss the stars? Kiss, 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 kiss the stars, stars, stars. How do you deal with mice or rats? Or do you have that issue? I don't think, I don't know that I've ever seen mice. I haven't heard of anyone having mice. Rats for sure. Actually, if you look back a couple years ago, there is a video where a rat runs along the fence line behind me. So definitely have rats. Um, but I don't think mice is a particular issue in this area. I don't remember even hearing about mice growing up. I do not have to deal with iguanas. That is one thing, um, talking to the South Floridians, I have zero experience. Even though I grew up in South Florida, iguanas were not as widespread when I was growing up. I think, you know, with winters being generally a lot warmer, they are spreading. I was talking to my friend who lives in Sarasota and she was saying they have them all the way over there, which never heard that historically ever, 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 ever. No. Beyond that. Yeah. We do get different levels of bugs from white flies, mealy bugs, aphids. Yeah. We get all those. But let's talk about how to deal with all this. So when it comes to all of your mammals, you want to keep them out of your house. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. First and foremost, keep them out of your house. So if, and I know the trapper guy, he's got a YouTube channel. He's in the Tampa Bay area and specializes in a lot of this stuff. And he'll sometimes comment really good tips when we hit on certain topics or answer comments. So you may see him do that. Um, but specifically the biggest thing with the house is right. You got to make sure all your holes on your house are closed up. They have netting, right? You need to have the whole roof line checked. I actually just, when I was putting up Christmas lights recently, I went and double checked all the kind of mesh that goes over to prevent things like rats getting in the house and into your attic spaces. So now let's talk about how do we deal with them in the garden, whether it's raccoons, <laughs> rats, or lots of bugs. So there are a few different strategies that you kind of employ to deal with them because I'm not going around with a BB gun and getting rid of any of them. And they have a place in the wildlife and in wildlife in the ecosystem, right? We're here, they're here, we're both here. So some amount of food is going to always get stolen by the bigger critters and even bugs, right? You just know that there's going to be. So one strategy is you overplant. You aren't depending on just getting the amount. So I know a lot of people ask me like, how do you prevent the birds from getting some of your mulberries? I don't. I know that the very top branches are gonna get picked off by birds. The squirrels will get into the top branches. So that's one piece. So you overplant knowing they're gonna get some. 
is the first piece. The second piece, harvest early. Very, a lot of your crops can be like, okay, I think one of the misconceptions happens is because there's a lot of talk when it comes to like food not being as healthy um, and some of the problems with the food supply chain is because food travels so far. Now the average piece of food is traveling thousands of miles to get to us. So when we say it's being picked early, we're talking like, we're not talking a little early. We're talking like a lot early, but in your own garden, you can pick early. So like you pick your bananas, they're not all the way yellow. They're like only partially yellow because it's the smells that start to attract whether you can smell it or not. That's what starts to attract them to be like, Ooh, there's food that's ready there. And they've got really good noses especially your mammals, but even like your bugs, they're looking for that kind of stuff. They're looking for these like high sugar content and that looks different for different plants, but that's how they're starting to like smell them out. So harvest earlier. So learning like how early you can harvest something, it still can be really, really nutritious and it can finish off in your yard. So we'll pull a lot of the banana racks before the majority of the banana rack is yellow. It's only slightly yellow. And then we let it like finish on the counter. Again, imagine from, <laughs> When these get harvested, like wherever they're getting harvested in the world and then coming thousands of miles to us, right? They were pulled weeks and weeks in advance. I'm pulling it a couple days in advance. They still have a really high nutrition content. It's not a big issue. Uh, same things with tomatoes, we'll do that. Mulberries, mulberries, there's so many that we can't even keep up. A bunch fall on the ground anyway. So I don't know that we're great at mulberries, but we try to pick as often as possible before they see it as a huge food source until we kind of are like, ugh, we're over it. Which kind of brings us to Norma Wong's question, who said, thank you so much for great advice. I do have questions regarding insects. It seems like I'm always behind on treating my plants. And by the time I treat, most times I end up losing the battle. Is there a way to know when to treat before the pest pressure? I realize bugs have seasons as well, but how do I stay one step ahead of a little buggers? Thank you. So this kind of goes to, um, while I don't actually treat for insects here personally, but I want to come back to that point. Um, we can talk a little bit about the pest pressure season. So we're harvesting early. So that's the one tack, one strategy for dealing with them. The second strategy is you just understand the seasons. So the pest pressure is at its lowest in the winter. Shocker, I know. And it's at, it actually kind of peaks in spring and in fall, not at the beginning of spring, but really as everything starts to ramp up in heat. And the way I've always really noticed this is if you watch butterflies, like the butterflies ramp up, everything kind of falls a very similar ramp up. So as you're starting to get a lot, a lot of butterflies, you can know that you're going to start getting a lot of other pests. And why do I point this out? It's because we've talked about this in some other videos, like things like brassicas start getting pest pressure from cabbage moths, which aren't cabbage moths. They are white butterflies. So if I'm starting to see lots of monarchs and I'm starting to see lots of zebra longwings and go fritillaries, right? I know that Southern white butterflies are probably not long behind or checkered white butterflies or the spotted white butterflies. Like there's all these common white butterflies. So just like my milkweed is gonna get pushed to its limit with a bunch of monarch caterpillars, my cabbage is probably not very far behind. So you can watch other desirable insects to kind of get an indication of like, oh, it's, it's coming because they're moving into the area. And we know things like your tomato hornworm and your cabbage moths. Cabbage moths are butterflies and your tomato hornworms are moths. And so if all your desirable butterflies are ramping up, those ones are gonna be ramping up too. So you're gonna to wanna to start pulling in your crop on the early side. So you don't even have to spray for anything. You just get it out of there. Now you may think, wait, aren't bugs really, really high during the summer? They kind of like peak and then they come down a little bit because it's so hot and it's so rainy. It kind of pushes them down a little bit. Not a lot. I mean, there's still a lot of bugs, but it pushes them out a little bit. And then they come back up as we kind of get into that big migration period in the fall. And then it'll die down in fall, which is why we spend so much time on classic vegetables in the lower season. So sometimes the bugs taking over, especially on that tail end of spring, you're just done with the season. They're putting a lot of effort into trying to stop them. Not a good use of your time. So don't, I don't, I just kind of go like, well, they're done, moving on. <laughs> moving on to the next thing, got other stuff to go do. So we've talked about plant extra, harvest early, know your seasons. The next thing you wanna think about is just barriers. I think about this a lot because of butterfly gardening because a lot of people ask tips in the other way <laughs> so when we talk about food a lot of people are like how do I keep pests out but then when we get to butterfly gardening we're like oh my god my caterpillars where are they it's like so reverse it's funny to me and that might be why I have some different insights into it because in the one section of what we're doing we want the bugs and we're sad when something kills the bugs and then the other section we don't want the bugs and we're mad that we have too many of them 
It's interesting, it's just fun to think about. So in that way, so one of the things that we always talk about in the butterfly gardening, if you don't watch my butterfly gardening videos, is, is that when you're establishing plants and there is pest pressure, or like lots of butterflies trying to get to it, is before it's established and it's smaller, is that you, you barrier it, right? So you put um, bug netting over it, or you put it in a location that they don't access, especially if you're talking about like milkweed or cabbages and broccoli and tomatoes, right? If you know you have a lot of those caterpillars coming around in the garden right then, you allow for the plant to get a lot bigger before you give them access because host plants are meant to be able to handle those caterpillars. So your beans, your tomatoes, your cauliflowers, those are all host plants. We don't like that they're host plants, but they are. So my advice usually the butterfly gardening people is like, hey, let it get bigger, make sure you have extra because your caterpillars are gonna eat it down anyways. And then you bring it out when the season kind of lowers a little bit and the plant's big enough that it can handle taking a little bit of an eating. So similar ideas, put some bug netting over, especially if it's established, if you're seeing signs that there's a lot of them and that just doesn't allow the moths and butterflies access to it. Um, other things like when we get into the kind of the critters, that's why I did things like braised beds is because I had stuff digging around in my corn bed constantly. <laughs> I was like, I got to stop them from digging up all the seeds. So I put a raised garden bed around it so that it was a physical barrier. So netting becomes a barrier. Uh, raised garden beds are in a way a barrier depending on how big the animal is that you're trying to keep out. So think about things like barriers for them. And similar in the vein of dealing with butterfly gardening, because there's so much conversation about how do I stop from stop wasps from killing my monarch caterpillars? And I'm like, you don't, you just have to let it happen. That's nature. So I will flip it around for you. How do I stop all these caterpillars from eating my plants and all these little soft body insects from killing my plants? Bring in predators. Get wasps. It's funny because like one group who listens to me is like, I don't want this. And the other group's like, I want this. <laughs> do both. Having both gives you new appreciation. If you butterfly garden and you vegetable garden, you will have new appreciation for different aspects because you have the opposite problems and it gives you new insight. So bring in predators. So for my butterfly gardeners, yes, you need to have wasps in your garden. It just is what it is. So what are we looking for in predators? Well, when it comes to the critters, having a dog helps. Some people have asked me like, why don't you have some of the problems that I have? Uh, my neighbor has big dogs. I clearly have dogs. Um, they don't wanna be around the dogs. <laughs> So it probably helps um, that they're around. Like do not underestimate that too. Another thing that I have around, I know a lot of people aren't big fans of them, but they help with rats and mice is snakes. <laughs> so in the very, very back of my property, um, I don't know if I've ever shown it, but like I have a brush pile. It's really meant to create habitat for snakes. So we do get black racers and garden snakes, gardener snakes, garter snakes. I always say that wrong. We have those in our yard and they, they will make their way all the way from the back, all the way up here. And then you'll see them squiggling all around. Um, and so also having places, not having a huge grass, it's not that you can't have a huge grass line. You need to have paths for the snakes to move around. They don't want to be slithering around in big open spaces that hawks can see them. So you want to have ways for them to get to your vegetable garden or your fruiting trees so that they can eat the rats that might be attracted. Just something to think about. Um, other predators that you want to get in your yard, you want to get wasps. So adding things like goldenrod is a really good option because that's a host plant for wasps. Now these are not your big yellow jackets that people freak out. My husband is like, oh my God, yellow jackets. He's always talked to me about these. And I'm like, I do not know. This is not a thing I have dealt with. And then I've shown him the wasps that come to our yard. And he's like, oh, those are small. And they are, they're like really tiny. These are not the ones you're freaking out over. Don't worry about these ones. So you can put goldenrod in, they host on those. Um, and then they'll be around ladybugs really important. And this is why it's super important not to spray pesticides because if you do broad spectrum pesticides, you're just going to kill all your predator species. If you butterfly garden, you're going to kill your caterpillars too. Um, but the big thing is, is that if you want, and the other one, oh, I'm sorry. Let me add one other predator, birds. Birds help. Like if you don't want these caterpillars on your cabbage, you know who eats them? Birds. You know who eats tomato hornworms? Birds. You don't need to buy chickens. Blue jays, mockingbirds, brown thrashers, cardinal, all them songbirds, they will come and eat them because songbirds eat soft body insects. They love it. So all these little ones that people are telling you to flip over every leaf, if you give them space to come in and eat, they will, they will eat. But you got it, but, but here's the problem. Here's the problem. Most people, when people talk about bringing in predators for vegetable gardening, they aren't thinking about the fact that you can't just give them, like, 
They will not hang out in your yard if they're only gonna eat the like four caterpillars that are on your tomato plant. You have to have things around that they give them constant food all year round. This is what you have to do. So you can't like be like, oh, I want wasps to come kill aphids, but I don't provide anything else that they can eat for the rest of the year. They're not gonna hang out. And this is where a lot of people have problems. Like they'll buy ladybugs, which there's a problem in that whole industry anyways. But there's a problem with ladybugs is people will often release them. They immediately leave their garden and they don't get the benefit of the ladybugs they bought. But the problem is, is ladybugs need food. And so while you have aphid problem on a plant, you don't have enough food for them. So you have to have enough food to keep them around year round, which is why adding natives is one of your best support systems for your vegetable garden because it gives them food year round so that when the aphids try to come in or when you know you got mealy bugs and all these other bugs they're already here they already see the area as like their restaurant cuisine Jacqueline chez Jacqueline right like this is their restaurant and there's enough other food for them to hang out here all year round to make little baby birds and all sorts of stuff and then they'll eat it that's one of the biggest misses a lot of people put in beneficial plants for vegetable gardens that only like give them this much and then they're like it doesn't work you only gave them enough food for tuesday what are they eating the other 364 days a year so that's the other piece you got to bring predators in um and then things like and that same thing goes for wasps you can't just hope that the wasps are going to hang out in the ladybugs you have to put in other pollinator plants and native plants are going to do the best at attracting them and getting consistent blooms check out my video about the 10 pretty where i've been putting out more videos in these questions about plants that bloom long periods and these will help wasps they will help ladybugs and then they're just here i don't have to buy any they're just here they'll come in once you put them in it'll take them a minute to find it but once they start recognizing they start having little babies and they hang out here all the time but one other thing and i've seen this a couple times when i've done some consulting calls with people if your plant is unhealthy and it's lacking in another area it will succumb quickly to pest pressure so if it doesn't get enough sun, if it doesn't have enough nutrition, if it doesn't have enough water, if it's getting too much water or too much sun, bugs, just like I was saying, like the ripe bananas will attract like rats, stressed plants will attract bugs to eat them like big time. And that's usually when you see like these huge infestations is that is a stressed out plant and it is sending out like sirens being like, I'm stressed, come eat me, kill me off. So sometimes a huge pest infestation, if it's not like some of these other things where you have like an imbalance, you don't have enough predators or you're taking time to establish, sometimes it's just like that plant is not doing what, because a healthy plant often can handle some aphids, some mealybugs. It can handle a little bit of it, but if you're getting completely overtaken, you should also be questioning, is the, like, does that plant really have all the other things it's supposed to have before you go grabbing any chemicals? Now, I think sometimes people wonder, does that mean like I am totally, there's never, ever, 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 ever a reason for pesticides. I think you should be very thoughtful because the whole idea of growing it at home is because you're trying to like be healthy and not expose yourself to stuff. But I will say there are times that makes sense to do this and like fire ants. I mean, you could do like the hot water thing. And I know there's like some bait trap stuff like fire ants aren't from florida there aren't natural systems for dealing with them and i think this also brings in with the iguanas my tip for iguanas i don't know enough about iguanas but here's what i'll tell you is they're almost going extinct in their natural range because people eat them so so maybe a new side hustle business venture when it gets really cold and they all drop out of the trees snatch them throw them in the freezer and sell them online because people sorry my friend she said where she's from, they had, um, they eat the iguana. She's like, it's really actually good. I was like, that's what I'm saying. People are asking me how to keep them out of the garden. My question is, is how are you starting a new business? But I do want to come to this one because San Almeida said, I always have questions I wish I could ask you, laugh out loud. For now, how do you deal with mosquitoes in your yard? I mean, it's Florida, there are mosquitoes, right? The last few years, or the last few days I've been eating live. Me too. Not by mosquitoes. I get sand fleas. I mean, I get mosquito bites, but I get sand fleas. I don't get as many mosquitoes as other areas do because St. Pete fogs like crazy, like crazy. Like I have been walking my dogs and they've just fogged me, which is awesome. So I don't, this is why I say like, I don't add chemicals, but the city does. So 
there's not real I know you can tell reach out and you can tell them to turn it off so that it doesn't hit your yard um but they're not very good at it so so mosquitoes uh the, the biggest solution for mosquitoes bats we haven't really I don't know have you guys ever looked around um I'd be curious to hear from you guys who live around Florida is how is your mosquito population and do you see lots of bats I see bats in the evening in the morning when I walk the dogs all the time we have a feels like a pretty decent bat population I don't know where they're living since I live in the city but we have a really good bat population so yeah I hope this helped you deal with all the wonderful wildlife and less desirable wildlife that comes to your garden and give you some ideas of how you can in a very natural way live with them one way or the other and remember we're in the middle of vlogmas and if you have a question that you would like me to answer and even if others ask it I will try to answer in the very special way that you've asked okay I'll see you soon bye